All right. Um, so like she said, I'm going to be going over just some mass training events and um, what to do during those. So first I wanted to kind of introduce you and give you a little bit of background on um, how we respond to things as, as well as where we are and how many animals we are or we respond to in the year because I do think that some of the things that we do is going to be a lot different than what is going to be available for you guys and um, the topography and bathymetry of Cape Cod is just a lot different than it is here so just keep in mind that the mass strandings that we're going to be responding to might be a little bit different than what you guys are, are seeing here. So um, this is where we're located. We're in Massachusetts in the uh, US. So we respond on Cape Cod here. So in the red is our response area. We've been responding since 1999. In this area, there's a tidal flux of about nine to 12 feet here. And in some of these areas, especially um, like down in, in here, that tide can at low tide expose one to two kilometers of flats. And so um, some of these areas are our hot spots. Um, our biggest hot spot is actually in Wellfleet here. You can kind of see that uh, the shape of Cape Cod in general is, is complicated, but there's this additional hook in Wellfleet that is also complicated that also has a really big tidal flux that can expose some some shallow areas, and so th that's our hot spots as far as mass strandings go, but um, mass strandings have occurred on most coasts of Cape Cod. We get about 15 mass strandings per year. That consists of two to 56 animals per event, but really on average we're seeing about five animals per event, uh, which means that we get about 72 mass stranded cetaceans per year, and that includes dead animals. So you'll see that number is a little bit higher than live cetaceans per year because we do include the dead animals in the, the count for that. So we, um, the variety of species that we see, we see we've had um, in our, our history 18 species, and nine of those have mass stranded. Uh, you can see Delphinus is our main culprit. Um, we've had 178 events uh, that consist of the, the Delphinus, and then the second highest is going to be the white-sided dolphin. So for um, stranding response, especially for any live cetacean but mass strandings in general, the goal is to minimize the time that they're stranded, triage them, so during that triage process, you're going to be making your decision on whether these are healthy animals and should be released or not, treat them, and then release them if, they, if they're triaged as a release candidate. So some of the considerations that you need to, um, to think over when you first get the call about uh, mass stranding is first and foremost, obviously, is your human safety. So that's going to trump any of your other decisions. That, that come along. When you're considering uh, human safety, that's going to apply in the rest of the, your considerations here. So what are your environmental conditions? Is it a nice day or is it a stormy day? Um, what kind of uh, like temperatures are you guys going to have to be uh, working with? And we all know that this, this work can be very strenuous, so you need to make sure that you're keeping yourselves um, safe, how accessible are these animals, and then um, how are you going to get to these animals? Are you going to have to get on a boat or a plane to even get to where these animals are? When you're, That's going to affect the time that it's going to take for you to get there, so with that you're going to have to consider what's the tide time for um, when they did strand and when you're going to be arriving there. What are your available resources? Do you have a lot of personnel there? Do you have the resources to get to these animals? Are they down a rocky embankment? Are you going to be able to get to these animals? Can you rely on local authorities to help get you there? Maybe um, someone can do some beach driving to get you to where they are if they're a little bit more secluded. Then um, once you actually get on site, you're going to be doing the physical exam of these animals. You want to pay attention to their behavior, their vital, vital signs, are there any injuries. Do a shock evaluation and look at the body condition. So are they thin or are they robust? And then um, if you have available diagnostics that can help 
further your um, your physical exam or your exam of these animals to determine whether they are release candidates or not. Then once you've done all of that, your options available are um, no response. If, the, if human safety is a huge factor in this, then it might be that no response is the correct response. Uh, can you tag and release these animals from site? What's that site going to be like? Do you need to relocate these animals in order to release them if they're in kind of um, a complicated area like we get involved in, in with Cape Cod if you have any secluded areas um, that it might be better to relocate them to a more open facing beach. Um, is rehab an option for you in your, in your area? And then euthanasia is also an option. So this is some of the specialized rescue equipment that we use. Obviously, um, not everything is going to be available to every network, but I just wanted to display some things that you might want to consider getting into your toolbox um, if you feel like it might be helpful. The mud mats are really nice for us because a lot of our terrain is in muddy terrain, and so in order to even get to these animals, we need to use uh, mud mats. We have specialized dolphin carts that have beach wheels on them, dolphin stretchers, but you can also just replace that by using a sheet. You can move animals with just a sheet. There's also these inflatable pontoons that we have found helpful for moving larger animals. Um, that's just a fake pilot whale in the top, the top picture, but in the bottom picture, this was a minke whale that we actually moved with these pontoons. And then um, if you have foam mats that are available, sometimes we do staging on the, the beach prior to release with these mats. But we also, part of our protocol uh, is actually during the relocation, we bring them into our specialized vehicle. And so that vehicle is also padded in order to, to transport them. So um, some safety considerations, obviously these guys might carry some zoonotic diseases, so just make sure that you have personal protective equipment, not only for the zoonotics, but just for any sort of physical injury or to keep yourself safe from the weather conditions. Um, again, what's your tide considerations? Are you gonna be having to deal with the tide coming in on you while you're responding to these animals? any um, hazards that have to do with the substrate or um, the access to the animals, actual animal handling. These guys are obviously really strong, uh, so you want to make sure that you have trained personnel that know how to be around these animals to avoid the flukes. In the bottom picture here, one of the safe positions that we like to have people in if they're going to be stabilizing animals is to have one knee up, so if they, the animal does suddenly start to thrash that you can quickly get away from the animal. Um, and you're just gonna be continually assessing these safety factors throughout your entire response. Even if you do a safety check at the beginning of, of the response, make sure you're continually doing safety checks throughout the, the duration of the response and make sure everyone's still safe. So um, you, for the initial response, you get your notification, you d you've done your safety assessment, consider if the response is, is feasible. Then you need to, de to determine what is the best access to these animals. Do you need to get others involved? Is there going to be some sort of transport in order to get you to these animals if it's a more secluded area? Or is it really easy access? Is there a parking lot right by them? And now you can all of your responders have this great parking lot that they can all um, park at. Um, or do you need to have a staging area where people park at one area and need to be transported to wherever these animals are? Again, the tide status, is it dropping or is it incoming? And that kind of determines part of the length of the actual response as well as some safety factors. What's your tidal flux? Are you, gonna, are you yourselves going to be in danger when the tides come in or is it gonna be a good level that it comes back for, for release? So then, um, once you're on site, if there are any crowds, you want to do your initial crowd control, make sure you're getting the public away from the animals and keeping them safe. Then you'll do your scene assessment, how many of these animals are still alive and how many have passed. Photo document the, the scene. Um, it, this can be really helpful for when you're reevaluating the, the event afterwards, if you do any sort of debrief 
Um, you think that you have really good mem memory of the event as you're there, and then suddenly when you go to debrief, you can't remember whether animal number two was near animal number five or if it was the one that was way down the, down the beach. So getting some, some photos to kind of help you when you're going to be reevaluating afterwards is really helpful as, and um, for any data collection that you're going to be doing later. So establish some sort of a numbering system, whether you use numbers or letters, it really doesn't matter. Um, we have found that these paint sticks are really helpful, especially for when you first get on scene, you just assign someone to just go number all the dolphins. It doesn't really matter what order they're in. It can, it, um, as long as each of them get a number, it's going to help you when you're trying to, to take your, your data later to keep the difference between them. Take more photos, again, to show the relative position between the animals to remind yourself later. And you want to make sure that you take a photo of both sides of the animal. So if you need to re-identify these animals later in case they've re-stranded, that you have pictures of both sides of the animal so you can identify any scars or the dorsal fin shape or anything like that that can help you match them. So then you're going to start your supportive care. Again, um, stay away from the flukes as much as possible. That's your danger zone. Get the animals upright if feasible. Some large animals, um, if you don't have enough people to get the animal upright, then that's not going to be possible. Some animals are just really fractious. They're really responsive. They're really thrashy. And it's just too dangerous to even upright them. So you want to um, assess that. Uh, place sheets over the animals to prevent uh, sunburn. Regulate their temperature so you can use cool packs if you have them available. Um, you can bring them in coolers of, of ice or um, just using buckets of water intermittently. Uh, another thing to point out here is this type of blanket that we have here. Um, they're called Equicool wraps and they're actually used on horses to keep them cool. And we've found that that um, has been helpful in our, our warm days to keep these guys cool. It helps. Um, dissipate the, the heat a little bit better than just a typical sheet would. You're going to want to try to minimize the stress of the animal the entire time. So only touch the animal when you need to do something with it. Don't keep your hand on it. Don't be trying to, to um, you know, check the animal or, or touch the animal more than when you're going to be uprighting the animal or you're placing the sheet and then try to keep it as hands off as possible until you need to do the next treatment. Um, try to keep shouting to a minimum, and then, um, if possible, dig around the pectoral flippers to kind of alleviate the pressure that's on the, the flippers there. You can do some in-water support. So if the animals are in shallow water, you can do some in-water support. So usually for that, we'll have two people on either side of the animal placing a hand underneath the uh, sternum of that animal. And if you have to, you can place a second animal on the top of the animal, preferably not using the dorsal fin as any sort of like um, hold, but just a minimum touch to kind of keep them upright. Make sure that the blowhole is out of the water. An alternative to that is to develop a sling. And so again, we in this picture, it's a dolphin stretcher that's being used, but you can just use sheets if that's what you have available. This can be good, especially if there's going to be a lot of time that the animal needs to be supported. Um, and uh, perhaps there's an area that gets really deep too fast, or if it's wavy, but you have another secluded area that you can kind of keep them stabilized in. This is a little bit um, of a nice way to kind of Distribute the, the weight evenly so they're not on, on land, but they're not, you're not fully in water like you are in the, in the top picture. So then you're going to do your monitoring and assessment of that animal. So you want to be look, uh, documenting the respiration rate of these animals, the heart rate of these animals, and um, a sinus arith arrhythmia, or what we call a split, is normal for these guys. So when they... In, when they breathe in, you're going to have a fast heart rate, and it's going to slowly um, decrease until their next breath. Check their reflexes. Are they dull or are they hyper-reflexive? Neither of those um, are going to be good. You kind of want to have just a normal reflex. To the, to, um, you can just check around the eyes to see if you have a palpebral reflex or a menace reflex. Um, are they reflexive to just gentle touch? Sometimes they're hyper-reflexive, and as soon as you touch them, they twitch. 
what's their behavior like, um, and then again, your, your physical exam. You're going to want to take some um, data on these animals, so getting some basic data, just getting length, sex, and body condition of these animals can be really important. So the body condition, again, is just whether they're thin or robust, and um, we have a scale of one through five to kind of um, to scale them on, so we can have a, a, a re relate that to our data later. Whatever tag or ID number that you've put on, on the animal, any monitoring and assessment data, so if you're doing repeat checks of their respirations and their heart rates, the time um, of the stranding, or at least the time of the report that you received, if you don't know the actual time of stranding, the time that you came on scene, and if you did release the animals, the time of that, so you kind of get a duration of stranding, and the time, type, or amount of treatments, if you're able to give any. So um, this is the identification tags that we t um, typically use. So these are a, a type of cattle ear tag, and um, we usually tag them on the, the upper third of the dorsal fin now. So those are a lot easier to see if there's recites of them, say someone on a boat were to recite it. Um, it's going to be a lot easier to see the number on the dorsal fin if it's towards the top of the dorsal fin. We also do satellite tags. so. Um, we don't want to take up the room for if we wanted to place a satellite tag in case this animal were to re-strand and we decide to satellite tag it on its second stranding. Um, but so this was our old, these are the cheapest ones and um, actually the old tags that we used to use. We actually um, found these Casely tags, which are very similar and they're also produced for cattle ear tags. But these ones are nice because they actually take a biopsy of the animal at the same time that you're tagging them. So one, um, it's nice because you're getting a genetic sample just automatically by tagging them. But also the way that this is gonna be applied is a little bit easier for, um, for healing because since it's a biopsy instead of the compression of the other type of, of tag, the healing is going to be, to be better. Um, and it's pretty easy to to use and you end up with just a small vial to, um, to store. So it takes very little, little storage room if you wanted to have a, an easy genetic sample. So um, some of the stuff that I'm gonna display now I have available if anybody wants copies of this, but these are the health assessments that we do for the, the animals. Um, this is just a snapshot of, of one of the pages. So. Um, obviously, we're going to have more than just doing a neurologic check. All of the systems will have their own, their own checks of the things that we're going to be documenting during the health assessment. And this is just physical exam stuff. It doesn't take advanced diagnostics for, for um, this data sheet. It's just your general observations of the animal. And um, then combined with, if you do have other diagnostics such as, as blood work, you can come up with um, a master problem list, which can just be just observations of the physical exam. And then you'll see at the bottom, we kind of have a scoring system that will score how well they, they did on their physical exam, what their behavior was like, if we ran their blood, what the blood results were like, and are they a socially dependent species or not. And so then we'll add that up and it'll give us a, a score here that can kind of serve as a guide on whether or not we think these are good release candidates, if they're borderline, or if they're a do not release and should be a euthanasia case. So then, uh, so that data sheet is all well and good when you only have a few animals and you can spend the time doing, doing that kind of assessment. When you have a mass stranding, you might not have the time to give them that in depth of, a, of an exam. So we do have kind of um, an abbreviated data sheet that'll just get some basic information from, from each of the animals. And um, you can just quickly write down you know, their ID number, what, what observations you have on them, but we all know the reality is sometimes you end up with a data sheet that's just a piece of paper. Um, so whatever data you do end up getting, um, obviously whatever works for you is, gonna, is just gonna work out in the situation sometimes. Um, this is a right-in-the-rain notebook. Maybe it is raining and you don't have your printed, printed
printed sheet, so you just end up with a right in the rain notebook with a bunch of um, you know scratch marks of some some data. So for blood draws, um, typically we use the flukes for for blood draws. So you'll be going for the vessels that um, go along the flukes here. Um, but I do want to point out that another site that we've been using, especially on larger animals, because obviously the flukes can be a more dangerous spot to be in, is that we have had success with going um, on the pectoral flippers between the radius and ulna. So we, this is um, two pictures of large whales, but we've also done it on pilot whales and Rizzo's dolphins. So you can kind of modify where you're going to get your your blood draw foam. This is also where we can administer any IV treatments or euthanasia if that's the course of action. Um, so um, that's just a, a site I wanted to point out that has been good for us. It's a, a safer spot to be in and can sometimes be more accessible, especially if they're in some sort of a, a left-leaning or right-leaning position. You can do some field blood analysis with, um, this is an iostat, so this is portable and it's um, battery run, so you can do blood analysis out in the field. We also have um, blood machines that are in our specialized vehicle, but that runs off of a generator, so um, this is a good alternative to be able to bring out into the field with us. There, um, we do have a publication on um, some past results that we've had and some prognostic indicators, um, including some, um, some blood values that are important to pay attention to when deciding on if your animal is a good release candidate or not. So then some common treatments that we will do is um, a lactated ringer solution bolus. This can really be helpful for um, mitigating the effects of shock and capture myopathy, which I think Manuel is going to go over in, in his talk. Um, we also give a dose of vitamin E and selenium IM intramuscularly, and then um, brief physical therapy in the water prior to to release, so that's just some pumping of the the flukes to kind of, uh, especially if it's been a prolonged response that they've been on the the shore for a while. Um, so these are some some good ways to mitigate that. Obviously, we don't want to release these animals and they end up in kidney failure within a few days or or weeks. So this is just some of the ways to try to mitigate it. Um, it's not guaranteed, but um, helpful in some situations. So then for some um, prognosis guidelines. So this is kind of going back to that data sheet where there was that master problem list and the scoring at the, at the bottom. So these are the, um, it can be a little bit difficult when you're kind of looking at the animal in one snapshot to be making these, these decisions. But again, this is what we do for each of these is we score each of these categories with good, fair, poor, or grave. And then those scores will add up to, to guide us in our decisions on whether this is going to be a release candidate or not. We have been um, trying to figure out where that borderline really kind of sits. Um, so we have been satellite tagging some of our borderline candidates to see if we can find any common threads. The um, previous publication that we've done with the prognostic indicators were good candidates um, and then animals that failed. So this is gonna be, versus the animals that failed. So this is gonna be trying to get some more data to see where that borderline really lies. So again, I know that this is a busy slide and you're not gonna be able to read this, but this is available if anyone is interested. This is the guide that we came up with of how you can score each of these things, so it might be complicated to decide whether the physical exam is good versus fair, but um, this is what we've come up with so far, so I'm, I'm happy to share this with anyone that, um, that would like it. There is a little bit of guidance as well on the, the blood work, um, the social situation um, of the animal, so 
Um, let me know if you would like that. So then, um, for the animals that are determined to be release candidates, during um, the process of the release, you're going to continue your supportive care and assessment. You know, even though they may have passed their um, their exam previously, you want to just make sure that they're not suddenly declining and moving more towards into a do not release category. You're going to assign your release teams. Um, usually, we want to for you know typical dolphin size, we have about six people per dolphin. Um, you want to release your dolphins in groups or pairs if you have enough personnel to be able to release them in, in groups like that. If there are waves, you want to make sure that you have your hip pointed in towards the wave and you're, you're ready to brace for each of the waves that come. And you'll um, monitor those animals post-release until you see them swim away. Some animals uh, we have had, we release them and they immediately turn back to shore. We have approximately a three strike rule for those animals so if they come back to to shore three times then they become a euthanasia candidate instead um, again that can change if you have really high waves and you don't have three chances to give them a, a release you know kind of modify your your decisions based on on whatever your conditions are So this is just um, a series of photos of a typical release. So you'll have three, at least um, three people on, on each side bringing the animal in. Then you'll kind of push the sheet or the dolphin stretcher down. The two people that are at the front of the animal will stay with the animal. The other four people will get out of the water and they'll bring the sheet or stretcher with them. So then you're just going to stage with those animals. Um, with the two people that are at the top, again, kind of the same um, positioning that you would have when, if you do any sort of in-water support, you have one hand underneath the sternum and the other can stabilize the top of the animal if need be. This is also a time that um, a third person might be at the flukes of the animal if it needs to have some physical therapy. And then um, on someone's count, You'll shove the animal off, and then hopefully they swim off. So again, um, we do do some satellite tagging, ta tagging of our animals, and so we um, only consider the animal a successful release candidate if their satellite tag transmits for more than 28 days. So that's typically around the time that um, the effects of capture myopathy and shock would have run its course, and so they would have survived the onslaught of the stranding experience. Now, obviously, if there was anything else going on with that animal prior to the stranding, it, that might not be an indicator for the animal's full life experience, but um, as far as surviving the actual stranding experience, we give a cutoff of 28 days. So then, um, obviously, another option for these animals is euthanasia. Our course of, um, of how we do this is to do sedation, IM, or IV, and then uh, pentobarbital IV. So again, um, for dolphins, typically, we'll do a restraint where we can lift the, the flukes and have access to the um, caudal ventral keel of the the animal, um, there's pretty big vessels there, so it's relatively easy, a lot easier than the, um, the vessels that are in the actual flukes itself. Also, a lot of times the euthanasia candidates are more compromised. They might not have the best blood pressure. Uh, so this is one of the best ways to um, get easy access to, to the circulatory system to make sure that the, the pentobarbital takes effect quickly. But like I said, we have used the pectoral flipper between the radius and ulna as a spot that we've, we have administered pentobarbital there, and um, it seems to, to work quite well. So um, I do want to introduce to you, though, that there is um, an alternative to using pentobarbital if you are concerned with not being able to get that animal off the beach. So this is an alternative. It helps to reduce um, relay toxicity, especially because if there's any scavengers that might have access to those animals. 
So this is actually using um, potassium chloride as the, the um, euthanasia instead of the pentobarbital. You do still need to use sedatives though, so um, you need to have access to, to that because uh, potassium chloride is, is extremely painful to administer, so these animals need to be sedated before you administer it. Um, this was initially developed for large whales, and um, Craig Harms has this, this publication here if you want to refer to it, but we have also used it on small cetaceans as well. So um, again, you're going to do IM and IV sedation of the animal using, in this protocol, it's using midazolam, acepromazine, and xylazine, but obviously talk with your vet and see what you guys want to be using. And then it's an intracardiac injection of the potassium chloride. So someone who's skilled in doing an intracardiac injection is needed. So this is the full setup for a large whale. And this can be modified for, like I said, um, small cetaceans. But this is um, you know, something to look into, especially if you do think you might need to euthanize any large whales. Um, this is the, the full setup, and it's described in the publication as well. So um, we always have on hand some um, bags. So this is powdered potassium chloride. It's basically pool salt. Um, so it's, re it's readily available for, your, for purchase. We will have that on hand, and then these four liter jugs of, of water. One of them will already be saturated with potassium chloride. We always have one mixed. And then we just have the other liters available for in case it is a large whale and we need to use multiple liters. But again, one four liter um, jug of potassium chloride can euthanize like two pilot whales. So um, usually having this much on hand is kind of being prepared for large whales or multiple um, you know, large, small cetaceans. Um, so again, you need to um, do an intracardiac injection. And I'll warn the next um, photo is bloodier than, than this one. And here, obviously, we do have some extra protective equipment because um, of the you know, risk of injury from such a, a large animal. We do have helmets. Um, and so you just kind of go directly behind the axilla to access for an intracardiac stick. Um, so this is just going to go over a few um, ways to restrain small cetaceans. Again, I wouldn't recommend this for things that are larger than, um, you know, your spotted dolphins and striped dolphins. When you start to get to like larger pilot whales, you you don't really have a chance at restraining a pilot whale. So this is really just um, some suggestions for, for dolphins for restraint. So sometimes you just need some minimal restraint. If you're going to be doing a blood draw, sometimes these animals are doing just this little bit of fluttering of their flukes. And so just helping uh, your phlebotomist to, to, by doing just a little bit of, of restraint can be helpful. Um, so you might need to do moderate restraint. So these are animals that are doing some arching, maybe not full thrashing, but they're just doing a little bit more motion. Um, so for this position, you want to be as close to, to the animal as possible, because if it does do a sudden kick of the flukes, you don't want to get smacked in the face. So you want to have um, kind of your um, body in contact with the peduncle of the, the animal in order to do this. And then um, we don't have good pictures of our advanced um, uh, restraint because it can be very sudden when it happens. But so these two photos over here are full body restraints. So you'll want to have one person on the thorax of the animal and another person laying over the peduncle of the, the animal. This is um, just showing the positioning for if you're going to be restraining flukes to be able to do um, or access the vessel in the ventral keel. So you want to have the flukes up against your, your chest, again, for in case of sudden kickbacks of that, that animal, um, you don't want to put yourself into a compromising position. 
So then I'm going to go over a few um, interesting scenarios that we've had um, involving refloating animals. Um, so this was on New Year's Day in 2017. There was um, 10 Rizzo's dolphins that were originally seen swimming in Wellfleet Harbor. And we attempted to herd the animals out of Wellfleet Harbor, but um, the animals did not respond. And so we were unsuccessful for, with that. So they did end up stranding right here. So there's this um, cove in Wellfleet here that the animals did end up stranding in. So um, those animals were uh, picked up and released at this site here. And then, um, so they were transported in, in our, our vehicle to do the release site. And during transport is usually when we're gonna be doing all of our, our treatments. Um, so three of them did end up restranding though the next day. So this is the restranding site here. And um, we had to pick them up and we decided to re-release them up here. So this is our typical release site that we use. This is our um, primary choice as long as weather conditions are okay. This is our primary choice for, for our release. Um, we can't release on um, this coast here because the, the waves are too high there and um, starting approximately here there's um, really high bluffs, and so to get down to, to the beach there, the, it's just like steep hills in order to get down, and we don't have uh, the capacity to bring the animals down those steep hills. So um, this is the best site that we have that at least gets them into open water, and hopefully they make the good decision to not go back into the bay. Um, that's also the safest for our responders. We do have more release sites that if the weather is bad at this site, um, the sound is down here. And so we have another site down here that um, is our second choice that can, as long as they go this way, they'll go out to the ocean. And then our last choice, but is always guaranteed even in the worst weather to be accessible is um, uh, down here. So it kind of depends on the weather and the winds, uh, the site that we, we choose. So at the first um, assessment of these animals, they were all in good body condition, and a few of them showed some mild serum chemistry abnormalities, so all of them were determined to be released candidates. However, like I said, three of them did end up restranding the next day. So on the health assessment for um, the animals the second day, they had a similar heart rate to what they had had the first day, but they had a slightly increased respiration rate, which could be um, increased shock and stress. They also had increased um, markers on their blood work for muscle damage, but they were still all deter the three of them were really uh, determined to be release candidates. Uh, this time, one of them got a satellite tag, and so the one that did get a satellite tag, this is the track that it made, and it transmitted for um, 88 days before the battery ran out on the satellite tag. Um, another one, which was in August of 2020, was a stranding of 45 Delphinus. So this, again, um, this is still Wellfleet, that area that I said was our, our hot spot. So um, this is where those Rizzo's dolphins had stranded, but the, the, for this stranding, this is where the um, Delphinus stranded. So um, for this one, 11 of them were extracted and released very close by um, because of the number of animals, we weren't able to relocate and release all of them. So 11 of them were randomly chosen. It was the 11 closest animals. Um, and so they got health assessments during their transport over. Um, on the way there, one of them died on its own and one of them was determined to be a euthanasia case. The remainder of the animals that didn't get relocated were released on site um, and we had boats that were available that met as the animals were released, the boats kind of came in and did some herding procedures and they were able to herd the animals to about here where it becomes more open and the animals became less responsive. 
Um, so we did have to leave the animals after the herding efforts were, were no longer effective uh, in this area. Um, in the following days, 12 of them were known to restrand and all 12 of them either died on their own or, or, or were euthanized. Um, unfortunately, during this event, we didn't get the um, cattle ear tags on them, and so we do think that we're, there was probably more than 12 of them that did end up restranding, but we didn't have the ability to match them to the original animals. So we only have 12 that we were able to um, definitively match to the original 45, but we think it could be upwards of 20 of them restranded, either already dead or... Um, yeah, already, the rest of them would have been already dead. The, the 12 um, definitely had restranded alive. Um, and so they were kind of scattered in a few areas um, throughout Wellfleet, the ones that restranded. Um, but we also, like I said, we had dead carcasses for about a week afterwards that we couldn't definitively match. So this wasn't um, our, one of our more successful events, but the ones that did get um, we relocated and released, all nine of those did get cattle ear tags and none of those nine were cited again. Then we have um, another event that was um, kind of interesting. It was only 20 Delphinus, but they were in two different locations that were about two kilometers apart. So not a huge difference, but enough of a, a distance that you can't just have one area that um, everyone is, is responding to. So for this, um, only 11, 11 of them were um, still alive. And um, the ones that were um, alive were, were released on site. They all received tags and a brief assessment and none of them were seen again. So those ones were released on site with the, with the incoming tide. And then um, earlier this year, we um, had five pilot whales that were in kind of a, a different area. So we're no longer in that hot spot of Wellfleet, but we're down here in what's called Chatham. And so they ended up stranding on this sandbar right here, which is um, completely tidally dependent at high tide. It's completely washed over. So one of the animals um, died on its own. That was actually the one that was the thinnest and the dullest of the group. So we suspect may have been sick prior to stranding anyways. Um, and then the four others um, were released on site. One of them beelined it over to this coast and became extremely fractious and not, we weren't able to um, handle that animal anymore. So um, it was the one that had a, a satellite tag, um, but we, by the time we released and that animal came over here, um, it was sunset, so we had to leave that animal overnight, and we came back to it the next morning, and the animal um, was doing barrel rolls when we had left it at night, and it was still doing barrel rolls the next morning. However, we were able to at least touch the animal at that point, the night before, it was so fractious that you couldn't even touch it without it violently thrashing. And so we were able to euthanize that, that animal the next day. Another one um, ended up heading north and um, for a few days was sighted in the channel here and eventually ended up in that um, top cove at the very north up there where it eventually stranded and we euthanized. The other two, the day of the release, there was a spotter plane that was up that was actually looking for great white sharks. And um, they were able to report to us that they saw um, the other two pilot whales leave out through this channel and out into open water. So um, those two had the cattle ear tags and were never seen, seen again. So um, we had about a 50% success rate with those animals. But unfortunately, the two that did leave, neither of them had a satellite tag. So again, we don't have our 28-day marker for, for those animals, but they were at least, they did not restrand um, like anywhere in, in our area, but also like any of the um, 
uh, areas nearby because those our cooperators would have known to call us if they they saw that tag. So then, um, at this point, I kind of want to survey the group and see if herding is something that you guys want to hear about because herding is kind of very like spatially dependent on whether you can you can try to herd. So we don't have any success in open water areas. And I know a lot of the coastline, especially here, there aren't any really like complicated areas like we have in Wellfleet or channels that animals get into or estuaries or anything like that. But is there any areas that you guys respond to that you sometimes have animals go into like convoluted areas that you might want to attempt herding? Because I can go over herding, but if it's if you don't think you have the topography here that it's going to be a tool in your tool belt, I can kind of skip it. Okay. Okay. Um, so at this point, I can kind of take questions. Um, I can also show you what our our vehicle looks like, the specialized vehicle that we have, or I can just kind of open to to questions from you guys. I don't know what the timing is like. <laughs> I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. We have two days for questions. OK. Right. Yep. At least get the the cog wheels turning on some possibilities that might be able to to be used here. Again, like I I said earlier, like a lot of this stuff is going to be very dependent on resources and stuff like that. But um, we're happy to to share what we can with you guys, so.